Good morning, everyone. Welcome to FMS. My name is Alan Cantle. Power and latency are the most important drivers of today's computing architectures, and they are often portrayed in the idealistic memory tiering pyramid. So I'm going to take a look at these together in this presentation. As we all know, the memory tiering pyramid has featured extensively in Flash Memory Summit's history, depicting uh, various technology shifts that companies want to sh show and where they fit in that particular uh, pyramid. And this can, uh, th this it typically looks like a pro the processor is at the top of the pyramid, and you've got the, you, you either have increasing capacity, latency and distance, uh, persistence or I.O. power, or potentially decreasing dollars per gigabyte, the cost of the memory, endurance, bandwidth, and power per gigabyte. But um, I'm going to just focus on the latency and the I.O. power, and distance is obviously a, 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 is a latency contributor. If we look at the tiers, the tiers I'm going to focus on are here, the cache memory, the, the a near uh, main tier memory, and then the symmetrical multiprocessing uh, memory, far memory, local storage, and remote storage and memory. So this is what we believe we have in our ideal world. But when we look at the reality, we see that we don't have memory tiering at all. We have memory forking because we have this processor in the center uh, with these multiple ports to the different tiers of the memory. Now, from a data movement through the tiers perspective, we're actually stealing bandwidth from the cores because we have to traverse through, the, through two sets of pins to traverse the hierarchy. And we burn unnecessary power then in the processor to make that movement with no added benefit. Also, the low latency near memory tier is really being bandwidth constrained because it has to share the dies beachfront and the package IO with these other memory tiers that are directly connected to the processor. But we do have the promise of CXL coming to the rescue here. We have CXL 1.1 with a directly connected um, memory uh, on, on the PCI bus to add to the near memory in terms of capacity and bandwidth. Then we have uh, CXL 2.0, which is bringing fabric switching to CXL, which allows us to, to not have the network switch to memory attached anymore. And finally, in CXL 3.0, we're going to get fully symmetric uh, interconnect. And that will allow us to do the symmetrical multiprocessing across this same CXL bus and therefore remove those dedicated SMP ports. So we can see here that we're, we're gradually reconstructing the memory tier and hierarchy back to its idealistic uh, shape. But we have one sticky point, and that is the near memory is still uh, out on its own separate ports. And so why is that? Well, it really comes down to latency. Uh, because the CXL port is a really a Swiss army knife of a of a far memory bus, it has more resources and therefore more latency to actually achieve that functionality. So you're in the region of 100 nanoseconds plus for, for, memory, for, for read memory accesses. Whereas the near memory is, is, has always been in the region of the 50 nanosecond mark. And then the cache is, we have three levels of cache taking you from a fraction of a nanosecond all the way up to around about five to ten nanoseconds, so you can see these are pretty, and these are pretty critical uh, performance impacts. If if we delay, if we extend these latencies too much, that's why we have so much of this caching. Um, and also, the memory is actually a parallel bus, and which are in CXL is serial. But that we've solved that problem because the open memory interface has serialized the near memory channel without sacrificing uh, the latency. So that's the good news there. And that brings it into the same domain as CXL. 
But we do have I.O. power challenges as well. So on the face of it, um, both the near memory channel and the far memory channel have very similar uh, energy requirements in terms of picojoules per bit. But we want insatiable increase in bandwidth across these memory interfaces, and that's when things get out of hand, as this graph shows. So it's showing from naught to, to or, or very small to five terabytes per second, and showing the representative buses. Like uh, at, the, at the higher end, we've got um, 32 CXL channels, which is very achievable on today's package and beach phone technologies. But we can see that the power rapidly gets into the hundreds of watts, and that's just for the I.O. The, men, the, the processor cores, could the compute side power, and the actual memory core power are not counted here. This is just the, the connection between the processor and the memory. So it's untenable, essentially. Now, we've already recognized that in the industry on the near memory side of the business. And we've seen Apple with their M1 and M2 and NVIDIA with their Grace CPU uh, move towards LPDDR5 uh, connected memory to get down to one and a half picojoules per bit on the near memory channel. And we've also seen GPUs and FPJs um, adopt the high bandwidth memory that's actually on package in getting to an I.O. power of around about half a picojoule per bit. And if we plot these on this graph, we see that, there, that, that the power levels, even at five terabytes per second and, and maybe beyond, uh, are, are, a little, are a lot more acceptable. Now, it doesn't come without its compromise um, because the near memory tier, um, uh, the, the, the DDR and OMI attached, is really getting you up into the uh, 10 terabytes of capacity range. But if you go for the LPDDR connected devices, you're gonna be limited to around one terabyte and HBM with the, with the future projections, you're probably still gonna be limited to around a quarter of a terabyte. So that's, that's one of the compromises. But when it comes to the CXL IO, there's not much we can do about the energy requirement because we are, by definition, traveling longer distances. And so the electrical implementation certainly is, is going to sit around this power level. And so that, that, that's a serious amount of, of power we need to start thinking about. So one thing we can also do to mitigate the power is to actually distribute the computing everywhere where there is memory and actually put a tiny processor near every piece of memory, uh, either near it or actually in the memory as well, in terms of processor in memory. And we can take every opportunity to do compute where the data resides before moving it up and down the memory tiering pyramid. And by that uh, approach, we will save some cons considerable power. So can we faithfully pull the near memory and the CXL back into the idealistic uh, full memory tiering pyramid. And to do this, we would need to um, uh, have two ports on the near memory. One that, so that memory was both locally accessible by the main processor, but shareable over the CXL fabric with everybody else. And this would be a really ideal scenario. And we would need to keep that near processor memory low enough power, but as we go out, we can possibly cope with higher power scenarios as we, uh, from a power density perspective as we go down the memory tier. So with, by doing this, we get a tremendous benefit because all of the processor I.O. is near memory with the highest possible bandwidth and the lowest possible latency. It would also provide the industry with a unified off-package I.O. For, the for all processors and accelerators. So that would allow us as systems engineers to plug and play processors and accelerators from any and all vendors, processor vendors. And all of these processors will be talking their native language of load store um, uh, memory accesses. So the world would be a lot simplified. It's a bit like the memory industry. We all use DDR in all of our processors. Well, we need to switch it around 
and because we, we, we need to distribute compute everywhere and there's different types of heterogeneous compute. And then as well, we would have a graceful flow through the memory hierarchy as the power and the latency increase. So let's take a closer look at that. If we look at the near memory first, we could do the on package memory, HBM attached, to keep that power down dr dramatically. And we may be, might be able to get some serious bandwidth, so I've said 20 terabytes per second is an example here. And at those rates, we would be in the 160 watt range for the I.O. side. So it's still high, but maybe it's manageable. Um, obviously, we are capacity limited. Or we could take the off package approach, but a, clo a closely coupled um, one where, where we're only burning one and a half picojoules per bit um, with the OIF very short reach file. And that would be around about 5 terabytes per second for the maximum package I.O. And that, that would burn 120 watts. So again, very acceptable. Then when we reached into the uh, CXL memory fabric, uh, we could do direct connect and just effectively double our memory from the 10 terabytes to the 20 terabytes. But we do add quite a significant chunk of power, uh, like in the order of 500 watts or more, uh, at, at, at that 5 terabytes per second. And then as we go through the layers of switching fabrics, we incrementally increase the power uh, required to qu some quite scary levels, to be honest. Um, and this is why the silicon photonics area is really trying to reduce the power here. If we can get the switches to be uh, co-packaged optics connected, then we can dramatically reduce those power. So we can, we can, we can help with this situation. Now, from a read latency perspective, we've got a much more graceful increase, as you can see here, going from the 50 nanoseconds to around 500 nanoseconds for these three layers of switching. But when it comes to latency, um, we, we, we need to look a little bit beyond that, because this memory tiering pyramid is actually <coughs> repeated from every single processor's perspective. And we've got lots of processors, because it's distributed now, right? And um, so every processor's local memory to it is far memory to everybody else through the memory hierarchy. And so we do need to take into account the actual physical distance between these, these, these different processors and their, their memories. And if we look at lots of racks together, we can qu you know, quickly come to adding another 100 to nanoseconds to one microsecond from a physical distance perspective. If we, if we extend that to a data center, these, these buildings can often be a kilometer or more long. And so we can easily see that, that the latency at adder there is in the region of one to 10 microseconds. Beyond that, we can go for in, inside a city, uh, like if between two buildings in a city, and we're, we're quickly in the 10 to, to 100 microsecond uh, range. And finally, we can go across the country or around the world, and we're in the tens of milliseconds to the hundreds of milliseconds uh, uh, level. Now, if we look at this, we see at the macro level, we can see that we've got really all of these processors with their memory hierarchies. And as we zoom in from the world to the country, to the city, to the data center, to the rack, to the, to the server, to the chip, to the silicon, we see that actually this memory term pyramid is, is, is being continually repeated again and again. And so I, I, I like to look at it like it's really an, a, nat a natural thing like nature in, in terms of fractals, where you zoom in and it continues to repeat. And I believe that this represents the idealistic uh, computing architecture of the future if we're going to be energy centric. Um, uh, in terms of reducing the power footprint of our systems dramatically going forward. So we really need to take a first principles approach to energy-centric distributed computing. So in summary, the memory tier and pyramid is architecturally very energy and latency efficient, and we really want to faithfully replicate it. But unfortunately, today's architectures are memory forking, not tiering. 
But OMI and CXL will be able to replicate that pyramid. And the coming together of these two bodies, uh, OpenCAPI and CXL, as we've heard today, is going to take us in this right direction. We need to utilize distributed computing for energy efficiency and low latency by putting that compute near or in the data so that we can minimize the communication up and down the pyramid. And we absolutely, it's imperative that we take a first principles approach to energy centric distributed computing. And that's going to be essential to the sustainability of the computing industry, which is projected to take a larger and larger share of the whole world's energy over the next um, uh, coming years. Thank you very much.